Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Central Baptist Clifton Springs live stream service today. How good is it to see some small steps being taken to lift the restrictions um, as we emerge from this crisis? After days of high numbers of deaths from this coronavirus and new cases emerging continually every day, it seemed. How good is it? This week we had two days of zero cases and zero deaths. How amazing, what a blessing. Families and individual lives have been shattered and pulled apart by this crisis. Many, many people have also suffered greatly financially over the period of lockdown. With jobs being lost, businesses unable to operate and do what they do best. For many people, the bills have piled up anxiety and financial stresses are beginning to surface along with the upsurge in mental health issues today is cap sunday and i am not going to ask you as you're at home to go to the wardrobe fish out a cap sit down and put it on to observe the event no cap is an acronym and it stands for christians against poverty It's a mission to all of our community. It's a mission to all of Australia, and it's a mission um, to overseas communities also. It's a mission that our church supports every single month, and we're involved with it in various ways. Today's focus is on poverty, need, and our response. Let me open in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, be with us as we worship you today. May we hear from you by your spirit as we sing, as we consider your word, as we pray, as we hear your word preached and see the possibilities of hope rising in people's lives where no hope seemed to exist before. Father, be with us and may our worship be pleasing to you this morning. Amen. Tim Hanna, the former CEO of Compassion Australia, um, and I know that many of the people in our church have sponsored kids uh, through the organisation of Compassion. Well, Tim is going to uh, bring us the message and tell us all about CAP's work at the same time. Heather Williamson is going to lead us in prayer and Lynn Taylor is going to read us the Bible the word of God. And yes, we have a kids video and it's all about poverty through kids' eyes. Ben and Elizabeth will continue to lead us in worship. Let's worship together as we sing of the light of the world who stepped down into darkness. And he did that so that he could be beside us and be with us as we travel this journey. Let's worship our amazing God together. Thank 
I'm Sam. Do you know much about poverty? Neither did I, until yesterday at school. Hey Millie, what have you got for lunch today? I have the best lunch. Mum got me my favourite muesli bar, lamingtons, an awesome sandwich and popper. Cool, I have an apple. That one? But it's all bruised and gross. Oh well. Hey, do you want to go to the board games room today? My feet are a bit too sore for playing soccer. What's wrong with your feet? These shoes are hurting. They're too small. Just get your mum to get you new ones. Do you know how much they cost? They're pretty expensive, you know. Mum said I could get my cousin's old ones soon. Old ones? Why doesn't her mum get her new ones? Her feet hurt. Surely they aren't that expensive. Mum gets me new shoes every year. So when I got home, I told mum about what happened, and she said something about poverty. That got me thinking. Is it common for people to not be able to afford food and clothes? Is this something that affects the whole world? Does it affect a lot of people in Australia? So, I decided to check it out myself. experience poverty in different ways, even here in Australia. I feel like my friends and I can help. Let's check out how. Good morning everyone. Before we pray this morning I want to read to you from Psalm 100 verses 4 to 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And as we come to him this morning, we do want to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Loving God, we come before you this morning with hearts full of thanks and praise. Your love and grace shown to us are more than we can imagine and more than we deserve. We thank you for your love and compassion, mercy and grace, and your faithfulness and goodness to us, your children. We thank you for our salvation and for Jesus, your son, who came to this earth to die in our place for our sins and the sins of the world. We praise you that he was obedient to your will and walked the road to the cross for the redemption of the world. We humbly thank you for the gift of our salvation and the gift of forgiveness and, of course, the gift of eternal life, which brings us hope. You are our Heavenly Father and you provide and bless us every day. For this we are very thankful. May we always have grateful and humble hearts which reflect your love in our lives. Father God, we come before you and pray for your church in the world, our country, our state and lo local community during difficult times. We are so grateful to still have been able to worship together through the means of technology 
and live streaming. But look forward to the time when we can fellowship together again on a regular basis. We pray for all those who do not have any access to church services at this time. Remembering the elderly in their homes and those in aged care facilities. Please, Lord, draw near to these people and give them a real sense of your presence and peace. We bring before you all those in our local community who are struggling at the moment. You know their needs. Please draw them to yourself and help them to look to you for their strength and support. Help us to share your love and care to those around us. We also pray for those who have mental health issues at the moment. Give them a special measure of your peace. Help us to be your hands and feet in such a broken world. We also pray for the school children who have returned to school after such a long break. Please, Lord, help them to catch up with their studies, especially those in Year 12 and facing final exams. This is a particularly hard time for these children and we pray that you will be with them and bring a positive result out of this year for them. We pray now for our church family. Firstly, we bring before you Andrew, the elders, and all those involved in the day-to-day -day running of the church and those involved in the live stream services. We thank you for all those involved in any type of church leadership and ask that your blessing be, on, be upon all who attend Central Baptist. We now bring before you all who are unwell in our fellowship. We pray for Melinda and say thank you for answered prayer with her recent surgery and the fact that she is now at home. We pray for your healing hand to be upon her and that you will bring her to complete health. We also pray that her pain will be controlled and she will be able to feel more comfortable very soon and return to a normal life as soon as possible. Please be with Dave, the children and extended family. We pray for Lorraine and her ongoing treatment. We ask for complete healing for her and that your healing hand may be upon her also. We pray for Carol's son who is experiencing back problems at this time, be with him as he awaits another surgery. We remember Doug and Pam this morning, be with them both. We pray that they may have a real sense of your peace and comfort in their lives. We pray for good kidney function for Doug and strength for Pam. We also bring before you Steve and Glenda and ask that you also give them a sense of your peace and comfort. Strength for Glenda and an extra measure of comfort and peace for Steve. Lord, we pray for any others in our fellowship who are unwell at this moment. You know their needs. Be with each one of them, I pray. And just before we end this prayer time, I want to read to you this prayer. Teach us, O Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labour and not for ask for any reward, except our knowing that we do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you this morning, Heavenly Father, that we can bring our prayers and requests to you, knowing that you hear each one and answer according to your will. And we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. The reading for today is Matthew 25, verses 34 to 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you have been blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Hello and welcome to CAP Sunday. Thank you so much as a church for partnering with CAP to find out more about poverty in Australia. It is my great honour and privilege to welcome Tim Hanna, the former CEO of Compassion, who's going to share with us today about poverty and the church's response. So here he is. Hi, my name is Tim Hanna, and I have the great joy and privilege and responsibility of speaking on behalf of CAP, Christians Against Poverty, who are an organisation doing a great job working in Australia, working with those under the blight of poverty, impacting and making a difference in their lives. So it's a great joy to be here to share that with you today. You know, poverty is a horrible thing, and I will talk a bit more about that in a moment. But let me first take you back to the first century. Poverty is not just a, a modern day phenomenon. It's always been there for thousands of years. Let me take you back to the first century, um, to a little place called Nazareth, to your sitting in a seat in a synagogue, a group of people who are meeting together on the Sabbath in the town of Nazareth. Nazareth, a town that's not of great significance in some senses. It's a population of about four or 500 people. And yet in another sense, it's very important. It's the place where an angel spoke to a young woman and declared to her that she would miraculously give birth to the Messiah. It's the place where that baby Jesus of Nazareth was born and to that young woman. We don't know much about the town. We know it had a, a carpenter's shop where Joseph of Nazareth was the carpenter and eventually um, that's his son Jesus became a carpenter in that town as well. So you're in that place, in that synagogue in Nazareth. Um, and one day at the age of 30, that young tradie went on a preaching tour around Galilee, somehow understanding that his life as a carpenter was to be more than that. And he went around his area and um, spoke and got great renown and great notoriety because of the amazing things he says because of his teaching. And so he comes back into the town and into the synagogue where you're seated. And one day he walks in and people are probably um, unsure what to think, what to feel. They've heard about this um, local who's, who's become renowned and in his area and so he comes in and he sits down in the synagogue with you. It comes time to read the scriptures and um, it's his turn. We don't know why he was chosen. We don't know if he was chosen or he chose himself. But it came to the read the scriptures and the scriptures, which was the book of Isaiah or a scroll of Isaiah, was given to Jesus to read. No one told him where to read. No one told him where he should uh, flick into that book, if you like, or read and from that scroll um, and he could have read from anywhere. He could have chosen scriptures that we know as um, now Isaiah 11. Of course, it wasn't scripture, uh, chapter and verse for him, but we know it says that from the root of Jesse comes a branch, and for him the spirit of the Lord will come upon him and the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of power, the spirit of, of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And this young man, Jesus, could have beat his chest and said, that's me, join with me, but he doesn't. It could have been what we now know as Isaiah 43, where the scriptures say, I have redeemed you, I've, no I've called you by name, child, you are mine. When you walk through the waters, I'll be there. When you, um, the rivers will not overflow you. When you walk through the flames, you will not be burnt, you will not be scorched, for I am the Lord your God. And he could have said, folks, that's me. Do you understand who I am? He could have picked that great vision passage from Isaiah 43, what we know it as Isaiah 43, which says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. It springs up amongst you. Do you not perceive it? Um, like streams in the desert, I'll provide a way in the wilderness. And he could have said, let's take the hill together and go forward and make a difference. But he doesn't pick any of those passages. He simply goes to what we know as two short verses in that place, in, in what's later become Isaiah 61 and repeated again in, in Luke chapter 4. He just says this, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. That's what Jesus says. There's the two verses and he rolls up the scroll and sits down. Amazing, just that's all he chooses, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor, vision for those who can't see and freedom for those who are oppressed and overwhelmed. That's his calling. That's what he says he will do very early on in his ministry. You know, poverty is a horrific environment for anyone to experience. And poverty is not just a lack of material resources. It is about that. But poverty is about a robbery. You are robbed of resources, first and foremost. But you're also robbed of dignity. You're robbed of that, you know, sense of well-being. You're robbed of a choice and opportunity. Make, to make different choices, you, you don't choose which shoe you choose you wore to wear that day. You're just robbed. You're robbed of that sense of well-being, of how okay you are. And more than everything, you're robbed of hope. Poverty leaves you despairing. It leaves you overwhelmed and submerged under the weight of debt. And poverty is not just a humanitarian problem. It's not just something you throw resources at, you throw money at. It's not just an external problem. Poverty is a holistic problem. It has physical implications. We know that. But it has emotional implications. It affects us deep down. It leaves you with feelings of of disempowerment. It has social implications. You, You live with the stigma in a community of being someone who's poor. And it has spiritual implications. It actually crushes your soul. And poverty is not just a developing world problem. We tend to think that's the case. It's very much alive here in Australia. Maybe a bit more disguised, maybe a bit more masked, but very much here in our our own nation. In Australia, for example, it can look like unemployment or can be made by unemployment or underemployment. Housing stress can be a cause of poverty. Increasing costs of living. If you're a single parent, it can have tremendous impacts on on your economic well-being. Inadequate welfare system where there's no net to catch all of your needs. It can be associated with physical or mental health challenges and it can be very rife in the disability uh, sector. It just affects many areas of life. In fact, some of the Some of the stats from the last Australian Council of Social Services report says that there are more than 3 million Aussies living below the poverty line. That's over 10% of Australia. It says there are 750,000 plus children under the age of 15 and children in poverty are some of the most vulnerable people on this planet. Single parent families are more than three times the risk of falling into poverty than anybody else in our community. And there are many more stats that could be quoted, many more that can make a difference. And that's where CAP comes into its own, wanting to make a difference in all of those areas and wanting to make a difference in the holistic way that it, uh, that it can in people's lives, making life-changing changes. Natalie was a mum in great need. She was a single mum of five children. She got credit card debt that kept building and building and building to meet family needs. It kept piling up and she accumulated debt so much so that it was seemingly impossible to to overcome. Debt way beyond her ability to manage. And uh, she sought help through a local uh, CAP centre. And uh, what would have taken her many, many years with great, great, great discipline to repay she found herself out of debt in 18 months. But more than that, she found herself, um, discovered the love of God and the care of a local church through that whole process. Take a look at Natalie's story. In 2010, that's when I had a um, traumatic event happen. And I worked for about eight months after that and then I couldn't work. I just struggled to work. I struggled with mental health and that's when like it, the bills probably didn't get paid at that point like I just gave up got back into work and I still couldn't pay and so I started like working on my mental health 
and that's when I got referred to Kat. The lady that showed up was Vanessa and then and she turned out to be my case worker that supported me the whole way through. I just felt um, an immediate connection with her. She was just a really lovely soul and uh, she really needed some help. She'd been through quite a lot of trauma when I'd met her and uh, has five children, um, two of them quite young. And so with her situation, she just couldn't see the forest from the tree. She, she wanted to get help, she was working, um, but she felt like she uh, was just working and not being able to get anywhere with her debt repayment. I saw like a weight, I suppose, lifted away from me because that they've taken all my money problems and they're putting it down on paper and working out, you know, what I can do. Working with Cap changed, I suppose, everything that, like, how I was living to how I live now. So doing it my way would have t taken me 25 years to get out of debt. Uh, doing it with Cap it took me 18 months to get out of debt. Thank you to Cap for supporting me through this journey because it's been a long one. Poverty does not exist in a void. It does not exist in a vacuum. Um, it's a symptom of broken relationships. It's broken relationships with others where you, you cannot do what others do and you feel alienated sometimes from others in this world. It's a broken relationship with yourself. You have feelings of inadequacy and disempowerment because you, you have anxiety and fear about not being able to cope. It's a broken relationship with creation because you feel out of sorts with the world. And it's a broken relationship, of course, with God, with guilt and shame become the prevailing emotions, the prevailing thoughts in your life. How could I let things get this way? How could I get to the situation where I cannot um, provide for my family and myself? And Christians Against Poverty, or CAP, is about making a difference for those caught in the blight and the clutches of poverty, working alongside churches to form a formidable partnership. It's a holistic problem, so it requires a holistic solution. And that's what CAP do, bring a holistic solution. There is, of course, the, the pragmatic way of debt relief where people advocating on your behalf to those maybe who are creditors of yours and, in, and, and do that with great empathy and with great care but also work with the local church and through the local church to provide training and, and opportunities to learn stewardship through cap money courses and other courses, who develop debt centres at local churches which bring hope to people, who will stand with people in times of need, of their greatest need, and who will guide people towards God who is for them and cares deeply about them. CAP Centre managers in that CAP Centre in the local church have a great ministry working with folk in their region. I love the stories that they bring. And Don is a great debt centre manager in Byford Baptist Church in Western Australia, leading the church's effort with people in that region and making a terrific impact in people's lives. Take a look. The biggest love in my life actually is people. I love dealing with people. Well, in, in the shop here, um, Anna and I have met so many people who were struggling in all areas of life, um, including financially. As to really helping people out of those situations, we felt very inadequate. Uh, but then a friend of ours came over from the UK uh, and told us about this organisation called Christians Against Poverty. And we're thinking, wow, well, that, that's, that could really work. Uh, it's a way of connecting with people, it's a way of helping people, and it's a way of them finding out about Jesus. His family walked in, who we'd never seen before, and that was Brad and Mel and their lovely children. Brad came up to us, uh, obviously very nervous, and explained that he was going to prison in a few weeks' time because he pleaded guilty to charges that had mandatory sentencing. Yeah, when he was due for his last parole uh, interview, his parole officer and him come outside and waved for me to come inside. He said, um, he has a pretty dark history. Um, but she said um, he has been the best parolee we have ever had. I tell you now, if it wasn't for Wife of Baptist Church, I'd be still on the street doing the wrong thing, doing drugs, I can tell you that. Yeah. We're working with Cap to pay our debt back. Sometimes you'd be, oh, should I tell them my full story or should I, <laughs> you know what I mean? But they make you feel comfortable where you can, so. If you want to get serious about the gospel, then you've got to get out there and mix with people. It's no good sitting in church. All the programs in the world 
all the fancy stuff in the world and you open the doors and say everybody welcome, it ain't going to work. What works is getting out there in the community, mixing with people, rubbing shoulders with them, serving them. Don't think about it for too long, just do it. We were in dire circumstances, but there are people who are in much worse need than us. Cap has done great things for us. I love stories of impact and transformation. I love stories where people's lives are turned around and are given hope and opportunity going forward. I want you to imagine the local church at the forefront with the gospel, including good news for the poor, forging deep relationships with people in the community. Imagine a movement of churches in Australia spreading the holistic message of hope that exists in Jesus and disseminated by the church. Imagine Australia having a network of grassroots churches bringing freedom to their communities. And dare, just dare to imagine a world where justice, generosity and wise stewardship abound and people are restored to right relationships with God, his creation, with others and themselves. You can help towards the trajectory of that world. Let me take you back again to that seat in the synagogue that I asked you to imagine at the beginning of this time. Jesus read those two verses. He read, you know, and then he closed the scroll up and sat down. And I don't know whether people might have been disappointed with this now well-known local who comes in and simply reads only two verses. Perhaps they were expecting him to, to read more. Perhaps they wanted him to, to say more. But he, he sits down and perhaps even discerning that there's a little bit of murmuring around the room, says something more. He he says, the scriptures say, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Say it again, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, that's what I'm about. That's what I've come to do. This is what the Jesus of Nazareth who you know is now here to fulfill. And if you want to follow me, by implication, if you follow me then or now, that is what you're about also. You're about bringing good news to the poor. You're about bringing recovery of sight to the blind. You're about bringing freedom to the oppressed. That is what you're for too. And, and that requires action, not just discussion or debate. It requires action. I've had the joy of witnessing transformed lives in many places around the world. People's lives transformed by um, hope and opportunity. I've witnessed for myself when dignity has returned. I've seen people's opportunities being taken and, and fulfilled. I've seen hope restored and dreams developed. And it's a wonderful thing to see that happen, the, the outworking of the gospel in people's lives. When lives get turned around, when families look up now and communities are forged and formed. So I want to urge you to make a difference. You can do that in lots of ways. You can give, you can pray, you can encourage people and do yourself stewardship courses like the CAP Money course. Maybe you can even develop a CAP Centre in your local church. You can see lives transformed. But let me give you some very pragmatic action steps that you can take today. At the end of this time when I speak, you'll see some opportunities on the screen. Get your phone out and type in unpackpoverty.org or you can scan the QR code that exists on the screen. Enter your details, click submit, and you will receive a whole bunch of resources that tell you a little bit more about poverty, what it means, how you can help in more detail, and how you can make a difference. You know, it's true to say that nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. You can do something today to make a difference in the lives of people caught in the clutches of poverty. So take that step, take maybe more than one step, and make a difference. You'll be actively living out the gospel as you do. Blessings to you. Thank you, Tim. And thank you to you as a church for being part of Cap Sunday. 
As Tim said, today everyone can do something. There are people waking up today in the middle of these very difficult circumstances without hope and you can bring hope to them. You can be part of the solution. I would love for you to go and visit unpackpoverty.org and complete your details. You will be coming part of the solution. And maybe today you could consider giving a regular gift to Christians Against Poverty and becoming a life changer. Life changes make a huge difference in the individual lives of people all across this nation. It doesn't matter on the amount, but if you could give a small amount, it would make a huge difference. Thank you from me and thank you for being part of the solution.
Let me bring you a blessing today. Lord, may you bless us and keep us. Give us all we need to be your people in your world. May we be a blessing to those who need your help. Lord, show us how to be your face shining into the darkness and to be gracious. As you turn your face towards us, bring us peace. May we be messengers of your peace to a world who knows no peace. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go well. Go in his name. Thanks for staying tuned. I have a, a sad announcement to make uh, to our church community. This morning at about 5am, our brother in Christ, Doug Doble, passed away. He's passed across that great divide to be with Jesus in heaven. In actual fact, Doug traversed that great divide years ago when he gave his life to the Lord. Our thoughts and prayers and love are with Pam and her family at this time. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Doug faithfully followed that way, and he is celebrating, and he is okay right now. Please join me as we pray for Pam and her family. Loving Father, thank you for being a God who comes for us and seeks to save us. Thanks, Lord, for saving Doug. Lord, we, we ask that you be with Pam and her family in great measure through your Holy Spirit. May you move very close to them in a very special way. Help them in their grief, Lord. Be with them and help them as they negotiate the funeral arrangements and negotiate all of the, the COVID restrictions. Be with Doug and Pam's grandchildren as they deal with their grief at losing their pop and also sit final exams at the same time over this next week. May this time be a time that draws the family even closer together as a family. May your presence, by your spirit, fill each of them. May you draw them to you. May you give them peace. Pour out your comfort. May they know your awesome care at this time. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. Go well.